The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. Welcome to a special edition of Cable Reports brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association, connecting Virginians with their government. We are pleased to have the president of George Mason University, Dr. Angel Cabrera, with us today. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Willie. Thank you for having me. Great. You know, I, I don't think a lot of people know much about George Mason University. Uh, it is the largest public research institution in the Commonwealth now. Uh, tell us a, a little bit about it. Well, you're absolutely right. We are almost 34,000 students now. 34,000. Two-thirds undergrad, one-third graduate. They come from all over the United States and even uh, from about 150 countries around the world. And what started off as a branch of the University of Virginia has now grown to become the largest uh, university in the, in the Commonwealth. And we're spread in, uh, in various campuses. Obviously, our, our home campus is in Fairfax, but we have a, a, an urban campus in Arlington where our law and policy uh, programs are. We have a, a campus uh, that I think you're familiar with yes. in, in Prince William outside of Manassas, and, and, and we have other, uh, other campuses in other parts of, uh, of Northern Virginia, including now overseas, because we have, uh, we have a presence also in South Korea. Oh, right? South Korea. That's correct. Now, how, how recent is that presence? As of, as of last year. Oh, really? It's a partnership with the Korean government. They've created a facility outside of Seoul, and they have attracted uh, four uh, international universities oh, to run programs there. So how diverse is your student body, and why is that important? Well, our, in fact, we pride ourselves that George Mason is, is one of the most diverse universities that you can, that you can be in. Uh, to give you an idea about half of the incoming class this year was either a minority student or a first generation student. But what we pride ourselves of, uh, not just the numbers of how diverse we are, but the performance. It is very unusual uh, to have a university like George Mason where our minority students do not underperform mainstream students. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's no, no, performance, no performance gap. And why is that important? Because the world we live in, no matter what industry you're going to end up working in, being exposed to people who are different from you, who have different assumptions, who may come from different cultural backgrounds, it's an absolutely essential skill to have. So it's not just a nice to have, is you have to learn how to deal with people who are different from you. Now, you've been described as not only someone who has had an illustrious career in academia, but you're a business guy. Talk to us about why that's important. Well, I, I, and I, I agree with you. It is very important for me, and I hope others uh, see it that way too. Uh, I always tell my, my colleagues, we are obviously uh, a, an academic institution, but as anybody who's run any organization in the world knows, no money, no mission. <laughs> so absolutely, we have to uh, be very, very careful about how we run our resources and how strategic we are in deploying uh, those resources, especially at a time where the funding of our public universities is changing so rapidly. And of course, I think the General Assembly this session uh, wants to protect funding for our institutions of higher learning as well as K through 12. What kind of challenges does George Mason face in terms of funding? Well, and we do appreciate the efforts uh, in the General Assembly to, to protect as much as possible. They haven't been able to keep us uh, exempt from, uh, from cuts in this past year, but at least to, to protect us as much as possible. Just to give you an idea, even uh, the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, a university like George Mason received about two-thirds of its, of its budget came from a public uh, appropriation. That now is, is down to about a quarter. And that has happened over a little over, over a decade. So uh, as, as public uh, support has been going down, uh, tuition has gone up. When people wonder why, why is it the tuition is, is, is becoming so high overall throughout higher education in the United States, not just in Virginia, the biggest driver has been the reduction of, uh, of public support, which, which is actually forcing us to, to think differently about how we, we operate and, and how we uh, secure and manage our resources. 
What are some of the other factors that contribute to the high, the rising cost of tuition? Well, that is that is by far the uh, the, the the biggest the biggest driver. In fact, what, when you look at the curve, it's almost a mirror image. Uh, public appropriation goes down, uh, tuition goes up. In our case, by the way, the the reductions in in, in public support have happened at the time where our enrollments were escalating. So so it's been uh, particularly challenging. So you've got about 33,000 students uh, throughout your university system. How many of those live on campus? We have a, uh, a little under 7,000 uh, beds on campus. Uh, in, in, in fact, we, we have a, a terrific and very rich campus life. But we always say that uh, we serve a very diverse pool of students. And diversity is not just cultural background. It also means lifestyle. Just to give you an idea, people sometimes are surprised about this statistic. But only about 25%, one in four uh, students going to college today uh, are traditional students, are what you, what you imagine exactly. as a college student. Someone between 18 and 22 years old who lives on campus goes to school full time. The other three are not that. The other three may be uh, adults who already have a family mm -hmm. and are taking classes part time or they go to a community college or they take classes in the evening. We always say at George Mason, we want to be a university for the four out of four, not for the one out of four, but for the four out of four. So we try to have a very rich and, and, and great campus experience, but we make sure we serve a, a broad uh, pool of students. So uh, for the non-traditional mm -hmm. student, for, for example, is what you're, is what you're talking That's about. That's exactly right. Great. Uh, what kind of a role does the university play in research? I know that's something very important to you and very important in terms of expanding the reach of the university. Oh, absolutely. In fact, in the 21st century, um, cities and regions and states and countries compete not so much by how uh, the natural resources they have or they, they, they compete with ideas. They compete through innovation and uh, it is essential that we continue to invest in, in research. We, we have a great diversity of institutions in Virginia. Not every university has to be a research university, but we are. And in fact, uh, uh, we're always proud that the, the international rankings, the Shanghai rankings, position us as one of the top 200 universities in, in the world. Every year, to give you a sense, we, we get about $100 million in, uh, in research grants from, from the federal government. In all the value of that research not only contributes to solving very important human problems. We're doing research in anything from, from cancer or even uh, injuries, in, injuries in athletes or drones and cybersecurity and economics and terrorism and a whole gamut of, of, of areas. But many of that, uh, of, of, of the outcomes of those, of those research programs, in fact, create businesses around the university, are the basis for spin-offs. They create high quality jobs. In fact, they contribute to dynamize the, the economy uh, around us. Now, what about the diversity of your faculty and staff? Is, is it a diverse group like your student body? It is very diverse, but not as diverse as the student body. In fact, that's, that's one of the areas that in our, in our strategic plan uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to improve. I would say we have, in a way, to mirror the diversity of the student body that we serve if we want to serve them uh, well. I, I am a true believer that diverse organizations are better, are more effective. So I, I see, uh, in fact, diversity not just as a, if you will, a moral imperative, but actually as a business imperative. We, we are able to, to look at the world in a much more nuanced way and make decisions that respond to the needs of a broader population if we bring those ideas into, inside the university. Now, you were previously at the Thunderbird School in Phoenix. You and I yes, were sir. talking earlier. Uh, what kinds of uh, uh, experiences uh, uh, there uh, have helped you here at George Mason University? Well, you know, we, we all, everything we do, I think, relies on experiences we've acquired through our careers. Obviously, uh, at Thunderbird, I was also uh, running an academic institution, so you have to balance the, the academic needs and the research agenda also with the, the business pressures you, you're under, and I think that was really, really useful. But, but then also there are big differences. Uh, George Mason is, is the first uh, public institution that I lead, mm -hmm. so I've had also to, to adjust my own thinking to, to slightly different rules of the game in the public arena. 
What about uh, your institution as, uh, as an economic driver? As you know, the, the Commonwealth is still coming out of the Great Recession. It's unfortunately still very dependent upon the uh, federal government. We have 44 military institution, institutions. We've got uh, the Pentagon here. We have to figure out a way to uh, diversify our economy. How can George Mason help in that regard? Well, that's an excellent question and one that is central to our thinking about our role in the region. I just returned from the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos in Switzerland last week. And the big question that is being asked by leaders all over the world is the question of competitiveness. How do you become competitive around the world? And no matter how you look at it, at the end of the day, the only way to compete again in the 21st century is by having the most talented people and the richest pool of ideas and innovation to create new businesses and, and, and new products that are going to be uh, uh, sold and, and in high demand around the world. Well, universities are at the heart of that. We attract talent. We educate talent. We produce new ideas. That's what universities do. In fact, if you think of, about the, the, in terms of the most competitive clusters anywhere in the United States or in the world, if you think, for example, about uh, the Silicon Valley or, or Cambridge, Massachusetts, or some of the other, there's always a world-class university mm -hmm. at its core. And that's what we're hoping to do, is to be that uh, source of talent and ideas in our region in, in Northern Virginia, but also serving the needs of the entire Commonwealth. Now, as you know, our community college system is very important in terms of uh, education and the economy. And I believe you have a relationship with Northern Virginia Community College. Talk to us about that relationship. We have a, we have a, a very close relationship. You're absolutely right. In fact, uh, to give you an idea, this year, uh, the number of students who come to Mason directly from high school mm -hmm. is about the same number as, as the transfer students that come from, uh, from the community college system. And most of them are coming from NOVA, from Northern Virginia really? Community College. So the connection is very, very tight. In fact, I always tell uh, uh, Bob Templin, the president of, uh, of NOVA, that he's really the biggest source of students that, that we get. And many more students, as tuition becomes, uh, becomes exactly. higher, it becomes really the path for many students to get their degrees done. So we're working very closely with the community college to find even more creative pathways for, my, for students who traditionally have had a hard time making it to higher ed to facilitate those pathways. So every year we're trying, we're trying new things, and they're working. And of course, there's the two plus two state program that virtually guarantees admission if one maintains a certain grade point average at a community college. That's exactly right. And, but sometimes, even after the two plus two, there are some peculiar uh, curricular requirements that sometimes okay. make it a little harder. That's what we work with NOVA to make sure that the path is as smooth as possible. And, and, and uh, every year we're making it easier for many more students to do that. Now there's been a lot of emphasis over the last few years about STEM, science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering, and math. But I understand that uh, STEAM is very important to you as well. Talk to us about what that means and why that A is important. Well, it's interesting that uh, many, many uh, universities in, in the United States are sort of envious of the numbers of engineers that are trained in places like China and India. But when uh, the presidents and the administrators of those universities come to the U.S., what they're asking is about the liberal arts mm -hmm. tradition in the United States. They wonder how they can help their students to be as out-of-the-box thinkers, as, as communicate, communicative, uh, to develop a whole host of, uh, of, of skills and abilities that are very common in, in the American university, not so much outside. And if you think about how companies like Apple, that even just yesterday published the biggest results in its history, Apple is not just a company that has succeeded because of its technological savvy, but because of their ability to design beautiful products that serve the needs of, of population. So that combination not just technology per se, but an understanding of human needs, understanding of, of art and beauty and design, and blending those two things together, that's what's really going to be driving the best companies in the world. And of course, we're here in the uh, basement of the General Assembly building, and I know that there are a number of legislative priorities that George Mason must have for this uh, uh, session. Talk to us about uh, those needs. Well, our top priority always is students, so we're always hoping that at least the investments in financial aid 
will, will, will remain at least as they were uh, in prior years. That's absolutely essential. Our second priority is salary increases for our faculty and our staff. Uh, we're losing competitiveness in terms of pay. And being in Northern Virginia, you know that we're competing with universities uh, right across the river, sometimes even across the street. So I think whatever we can do in terms of, uh, of faculty and staff salaries is, is crucial. We obviously um, are always uh, trying to figure out how to strengthen our research capabilities in, in various areas that are critical to the competitiveness of the region, like healthcare, like cybersecurity, like IT. And finally, capital projects. I mean, we have grown. It's been an explosion in the number of students that we serve, and we're sometimes bursting at the seams. Our, our capacity, our, our physical infrastructure, does not, is not at the level that we need it to be. So we're hoping to get some support for some critical uh, capital projects. So how and where would you expand if you get the money that you need? Well, we, our, our top priority uh, for the coming years is we, we have a massive sort of academic building in the heart of our Fairfax campus that, that houses uh, okay. almost half of all the classes that we teach wow. in Fairfax. And uh, it's, a, it's a building that was uh, done in the 70s and that is really not at the level that it should be. It's insufficient in space and it's just not at the level of, of technological sophistication that we needed. So that's going to be probably our, our, our centerpiece. Now, to what extent is the university taking advantage of, of new technologies? For example, we talk about the non-traditional student uh, and uh, the, the, the potential for them to use the Internet. Do you have any online courses that students We do. Yeah, we, we have a number of online courses. In fact, uh, it is part of our strategy to, to grow the portfolio of, of courses and, and even programs that we offer uh, online. The Internet is changing the way we work, the way we live. It's also changing the way we learn. And even though sometimes we try to be a little bit uh, defensive about, uh, about protecting, if you will, a traditional concept of higher education, our students are already beyond that. If you think about it, the students who are coming next year to college, they were born in 1997. 1997. They, they, they do not know a world, not just without an internet, they don't know a world without the internet in their pocket. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you have to figure that into, into the way you, you, you design programs and the way you, you help them learn and grow. So uh, eventually no more bricks and mortars, no more or a university without walls? No, I think we will still need bricks and mortar, but it's going to be used differently. Uh, we, some of the new classrooms that we've designed, in fact, in our Fairfax campus, are what we call flipped classrooms. They look very different from what uh, you and I probably remember uh, in, our, in our times as, our, as students. Okay. These are not rows of seats and, and, exactly. and blackboards. These are uh, really round spaces with, with a lot of technology, with, with group tables. These are places where when students come together, they come together to work in projects, uh, to get their hands on, on tasks, to interact with the faculty in a very different way. So that collaboration among students, faculty, and staff is part of the learning experience and is very important. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, what's happening is that the traditional lecture, if you will, right. that's what's moving online. Because a lecture is very easy to do, is to do online, and in fact, it's better sometimes for the student. Think about it. If you, if you watch a lecture online, you can pause it. Mm -hmm. If you need to pause it, you can rewind it, you can fast forward. You cannot do that with a real professor in front of you. So the lecture is moving online, but some of the activities that are really more hands-on, those are the activities for which uh, a classroom really is, uh, it cannot be replaced. Talk to us a little bit more about uh, your expansion into Korea. You mentioned that you have, a, you have a, an institution there. How large is it and uh, what are some of the course offerings that people can take advantage of if right. they are there? It's, right now it's small, it's, um, but it's, it's focused on business and economics. Mm -hmm. uh, there, as I said, there are four uh, international universities uh, working in, in a facility, it's really a world-class facility that was been entirely built and, and financed by, by the Korean government. And um, it, it serves both uh, Asian and Korean students who spend some time in Korea, but also then come to our campus in Fairfax, therefore enriching the, the international diversity uh, on our campus. But it's also a platform for students in Fairfax who want to have an experience in Asia. And they can uh, spend a semester or a year in, uh, on our campus in Korea and experience Asia and, and even learn uh, Korean and learn Chinese. And, 
and do that in a, in a very seamless way and in fact continue to pay their in-state tuition. So that, that's what we're hoping that it will become a, a bigger platform for many of our Fairfax students uh, to, to have an international experience. Uh, talk to us a little, about, a little bit about the current controversy uh, here in the General Assembly uh, relating to sexual assaults on, on campuses. I know that's a topic of discussion amongst the entire university community. It's a very complex issue. Uh, so talk to us about the balance that's going to have to be maintained to protect the victims, but to make sure that the scoff laws are appropriately punished. Right. Well, I'll tell you, the, the part of this that is not controversial at all is a desire by each one of my colleagues, uh, presidents of all the universities, the faculties, to eradicate sexual violence from our campus. There's no controversy about that. Uh, the absolute first priority that we all have is to make sure our students are safe. Uh, without that, no, nothing else that we can do uh, in, in our institutions really would work. And we're committed to doing whatever it takes to make sure there are sometimes debates and controversies about the numbers. Uh, is it, you know, what is the percentage? Honestly, even if it's one in 100, you know, mm -hmm. that will be one too many. So we're committed to that. I joined the governor's task force uh, for combating uh, campus sexual assault. I'm one of two uh, presidents who serve in that task force. Uh, in my part, my, my group, we're focusing on prevention. So we're doing lots of things. Uh, I totally understand that there is social pressure uh, for the General Assembly to maybe pass some legislation. Um, my, my hope is that, uh, is that we think carefully about it. Some of the ideas that, that appear to be obvious and, and reasonable ideas, when you talk to the experts like I'm doing, it turns out they sometimes have unintended uh, consequences. You, you may think that it helps, but it might, for example, reduce uh, the likelihood that a victim will report a case. So my, my, my hope is that, say, we all share this goal. Perhaps let's let the, the governor's task force to, to take its course, to come back with, uh, with recommendations, and then let's try to figure out what is the smartest legislation that would help uh, in a goal that absolutely we all share. So you're talking about some of the, some of the proposals that would mandate uh, a reporting requirement to law enforcement. It right. could have unintended consequences, for example. Uh, for example, I mean, uh, right now one of the problems that we have uh, is that not every, in fact, few victims report. Uh, and, and if there's no report, there's very little that you can do. Um, and some of the of some of the uh, of the ideas that are being proposed, in fact, may reduce the mm -hmm. willingness of a victim mm -hmm. to report. So that's just one of the one of the examples. And there are also Title IX considerations because we have this federal law on top of whatever uh, the state comes up with. Absolutely, we're subject to Title IX. We're subject to Clery Act. We're subject to lots of regulations uh, from the federal government. So there's there is a a wealth of, of legislation and a wealth of regulation uh, already in place. Um, and unfortunately, the numbers of cases has not, has not declined over the last few years. So I honestly, I welcome the attention that this issue is receiving uh, from all, at all levels, from the White House to the governor to the General Assembly. I think that's good. And I'm hoping that we can use that, that intensity of, of attention on this issue to really uh, make some smart uh, decisions. So give us an idea of the kinds of discussions you've been involved in around prevention. Because obviously uh, that, that, that's a fundamental route to, to, uh, to pursue. Absolutely. Well, one of the discussions is how do, we, how do we know whether we're doing better or worse? And looking at reports alone is really a bad way to do it mm -hmm. because you may have more cases than, than you think. In fact, you may be doing worse and, and, and yet reports may be going down or the opposite. You could see that reports are going up and say, gosh, things are getting worse. And in fact, you're doing a better job of convincing victims to report. So we're trying to figure out how to use surveys to get a clearer picture of what's going on and, and bring clarity to this sometimes noise of, of, of data. We need to know the evidence. We're also working on, uh, on bystander prevention. It turns out that some of the traditional uh, training programs that are run with, uh, with students are not very effective. But when you treat all students as potential helpers in the case, as bystanders, what can you do? We know, you're, you know the vast majority of our students, male or female, will never engage in any of this. If you train them, what is it you can do if you're aware of something happening? 
that's the type of, uh, of, of prevention intervention that the experts say is most effective. So we're hoping to also have some of those best practices uh, across the universities. And then we're also, of course, working on best practices and how to respond, how to protect the victims, how to deal with investigations, and so forth. So it's a very, very complex matter. Better to do it right than to do it quickly, I take it. That's exactly right. That's exactly, that's exactly right. So let's talk about your vision of, of the future. Uh, hopefully you're, you're going to be here for uh, a long time. Uh, where do you see George Mason 10 or 20 years from now? Or what would you like to see? Well, I think uh, it's going to be George Mason is on, on, a, on an incredible trajectory. It already has been, and I hope that trajectory will continue. It will be, it will be bigger than what it is today. It will be even more uh, technologically sophisticated in the way we, we use information technology and, and blend it in the current things we do. I think you're going to see a university that does even more research, that is going to have some world-class labs uh, across multiple disciplines, that is going to be a, a true research powerhouse. And in fact, you're going to see a university that more and more is going to become an incubator of new ideas. Ideas not just that will turn into new businesses, but also new nonprofit organizations and, and social enterprises. It's going to be really uh, the, the incubator of, of activity. In our so there were a number of things I found on the George Mason website, and I would commend it to everyone. It's a great website. You have a blog there that you're in, that you're in communication with the students. You did a Reddit uh, one day uh, talking back and forth with students. But uh, one of the things I found were the seven focus areas that uh, you had committed to driving innovative learning, for mm -hmm. example. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, that's just a recognition that uh, uh, really the, the new technologies offer us new ways to learn and that, in fact, it is our obligation to be at the forefront. Instead of being, uh, if you will, defensive, I think what we need to do is embrace what the new technologies uh, can, can, can offer to improve the way uh, uh, students learn. So we're going to see lots of, we're already driving lots of experiments and we're injecting you know, some attention and resources in some of those areas. And you've talked about research, but uh, you talk specifically here about encouraging research of consequence. That's the key, that's the key word. At the end of the day, we're a public asset and we engage, there's always a risk uh, that some academic institutions end up focusing on problems that may matter only to themselves. And I would say, you know, we, we are a public institution and we owe ourselves to solving problems that matter. How do we use science and scholarship to really uh, make a, a, the world more peaceful, uh, more prosperous uh, for everybody? And then, of course, building a foundation for the future. That's critical. Absolutely. Uh, as I said at the beginning, no money, no mission. None of the, of the big dreams that we have can be done unless we find the resources to make them happen. And increasingly, that means not only uh, public support, which I hope will always be there, but also private support. So we're spending a lot of time telling our story around us. Thank you for being here, Dr. Angel Cabrera. Thank you, sir, for having me. Thank you for watching a special edition, edition of Cable Reports brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association, connecting Virginians to their government. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans.